All right. So welcome to my talk, Postmortem Culture at Google. How do we learn from failures and how can you too? Before we go into the actual content, there are a few thoughts that I would like to share with you. So the first thing is um, it's a beautiful new world. You can uh, hold a talk from wherever you are. You can listen to a talk at whatever time you want um, at, at any speed that you want. So that is, that is beautiful. On the other hand, uh, what I personally really miss is uh, is feedback and the floor talk of conferences and so on. So um, if you um, if you have feedback, if you have questions, I would urge you please drop me a line, please write me an email, and, and I promise I will get back to you um, um, as soon as possible. Um, yeah. Also, before I start a few words about myself. I joined Google in May 2020, so shortly after the pandemic uh, started as a technical program manager. And um, yeah, my main team is an SRE team um, responsible for Google's um, capacity management slash quota systems that are used by the majority of internal services and foundational services. And uh, there are a lot of interfaces with our dev partners, but obviously also um, with other teams. And um, yeah, as a TPM, I'm kind of like the, the glue between all these teams. One topic that I picked up also pretty much from um, the beginning when I joined Google were postmortem processes at the larger organization. And um, yeah, therefore, I'm really interested in uh, postmortems. Uh, reading postmortems, evaluating postmortems, improving processes. And um, yeah, today I would like to give you an idea on, on how it looks, uh, uh, how these processes look like at Google, and, and would like to extract the gist for you. So what do you really need? Um, what do you really need uh, to also start um, a process on your own? And um, also, I should right away make the disclaimer, the um, the process, and it's, there's not just one process, but the process that we have at Google evolved over um, many, many, many years. Um, and I'm pretty sure that um, you need, uh, you, you only need part of it actually to really start successfully. And yeah, before my time at Google, I, I was a consultant in, um, in, in, in IT consulting. Um, and there I have seen several postmortem processes that sometimes worked, sometimes did not work so well. And I tried to um, yeah, translate some of these uh, learnings uh, here too. All right. And with that, let's start with the introduction. I would like to clarify what are postmortems, why should we write postmortems, and how should we write postmortems, or maybe even better, how should we not write postmortems? Before we go into postmortems, there's, I think, one important thing that we need to, um, to make sure. And I think error culture is like kind of like the foundation. So if you have, uh, if you have error culture properly set up, yeah, if you, for example, accept that 100% is the wrong target, then that's already a quite a good foundation to um, introduce postmortems um, to address very specific um, outages, yeah? to make sure that very specific outages don't reoccur. Outages of a certain severity or outages with a certain impact pattern, we'll come to that later. But error culture is really the foundation. So if you accept that things can go wrong, that uh, you can go to at a certain speed and rolling out new features, and that these features might also sometimes be not as robust as you initially thought, if you accept that, then I think you're already in the right spot. Um, and then postmortems are a tool to manage the risk. Yeah? Not the only tool, but uh, definitely a tool to, to manage the larger risks. And yeah, by that, you're accepting that failure is something normal. And this is kind of like symbolized by the um, spare tire on, on the car that you have on the right side here. Yeah, and um, I think this is also pretty much in line with uh, with SRE culture in general, yeah. I mean, if we think about SLOs, um, all these kind of things accept failure as something normal. And sometimes we fail a bit more than we were actually expecting. And this is uh, where postmortems typically um, come into play. So what are postmortems? 
postmortems are a written record of an incident and they capture what happened usually with, with quite a bit of context that help you understanding the situation also in retrospect why did it happen so these this answers questions like what was the root cause and what did actually trigger the outage and what do we plan to make sure that uh, outages that similar outages in the future can be prevented and they are not an invention of the IT industry. Postmortems are, for example, used in uh, aviation and also healthcare industry for quite a while already. And um, they are sometimes named differently, but the idea is always the same. And good postmortems, in particular, explain the background why the relevant actions or root causes or triggers exist yeah? and they include the historical uh, context in the explanation and this is valuable because um, none of the systems that we that we take care of usually are as bad because we are bad engineers we all suffer from uh, decisions that we made in the past decisions about a certain use case that we want to support which is maybe not even present anymore, it's not used anymore, yeah? Um, certain assumptions about our users that have, not, um, that have not been proven to be true and various other things. And um, this therefore, this context is really important, yeah? And um, good postmortems also tell a story, yeah? They tell a story from, um, from uh, yeah, basically, how did we get where we are now? And don't get me wrong, Postmortem should tell the full story, but references in particular to the context um, are quite useful um, to, to make people aware of why we are in the current situation and to also maximize the learning um, from that uh, journey. Okay, so um, why should we write postmortem? So what do we get when we write postmortems? Um, so primarily they are a tool to learn as an organization and to prevent uh, future outages. And they are well suited for a little bit more complex uh, outages and, and uh, systemic failures. So if you apply a postmortem to, uh, to every bug, then this is most likely, um, yes, most likely um, too expensive. I mean, postmortems are definitely not a lightweight tool in the sense that you have, have, have it written up in, uh, in 10 minutes or so. Yeah, so you, you need to spend quite a bit of time um, and um, there's, a, there's a, quite a bit of analysis and so on involved. And therefore, they're not suitable for any small problem. Yeah? But as soon as you have a problem that needs some more thoughts, um, they're a quite good way to, yeah, to maximize the learning um, from such an outage, for example. Yeah, and um, one other benefit um, that I see with postmortems, if they are written well, then they can be consumed by the entire team and the entire organization. And by that, you maximize learning. Yeah, you maximize the spread of best practices and of um, and of principles that you derive from maybe even multiple outages. Speaking about multiple outages, um, if you have a good, um, yeah body of postmortems like multiple postmortems then you maybe able, might be able to recognize pattern um, like failure pattern that you see again and again and this this helps you to address um, problems also on a higher level and um, yeah these uh, so I think Ben made the claim a while ago Ben trainer made the claim a while ago we've seen most common patterns uh, in reviewing postmortems and we are writing infrastructure to eliminate them and then you might, uh, might ask, okay, we done that, yeah, but why do outages then still happen? And I think seeing the pattern again and again uh, is is not too surprising. The um, the the actual thing that you that you that you see in in some cases that um, infrastructure, for example, that you have created to prevent a certain outage was not applied to another part because that part works quite differently and it was not adoptable. So you couldn't apply these learnings. So in this case, you make sure that the learning can also be applied to another area. Or, and this is also something that you definitely see, is you have eliminated a certain outage pattern and now other pattern become by that more important. Okay, um, one really other important thing I want to make, uh, important point that I want to make is um, it's, not a, it's not a thing that you do once. Yeah, so you maybe look at past postmortems and um, once you've done that analysis, um, 
you make maybe some changes. You can prioritize, for example, certain deprecation efforts. That's something that I have um, seen very often, that if you have to decide between multiple programs or projects, how do you prioritize them for reliability? And um, this, is, uh, this is something where postmortems can help in the decision. Um, I think the other the other aspect is that they make uh, they make reliability engineering quite measurable over a long term. But overall, I think the key thing is you need to do it again and again. A process is a postmortem process is something that that is never done. Yeah. So you even if you see things again and again, pattern again and again, it's always about risk management, risk control. So um, it's a continuous process. One other thing that I want to mention as well is postmortems are not a tool to punish people that are involved uh, in or, did, or who did contribute to the outage. And that bring me, brings me to one point that I uh, want to summarize here. Um, I'll not go um, more into detail because this would this topic alone would warrant for a whole talk. And this is postmortems should be blameless. So blame if you if you have if you blame people in postmortems or teams. Um, then you miss an opportunity to maximize the organizational learning or in general to maximize the learning from a postmortem. So psychological safety is really important because um, by that you make sure that um, by that you make sure that people ask questions, that people are open-minded and admit failures. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, this is otherwise not surface if people are afraid of, uh, for example, retaliation. On the opposite, one, <laughs> one, uh, one word of caution, postmortems should also not uh, celebrate or not overly celebrate heroism. So if you have postmortems again and again where people celebrate, oh, and this person was up during the night and was able to fix our problem, then this might not, or this is most likely not sustainable for a team. So um, be very careful. So I think it's Totally okay to call out where we have where we got lucky in a certain incident or in a certain outage, but um, it should not celebrate uh, unreasonable heroism because that's not sustainable on the long term. All right, so um, I hope I have convinced you so far that postmortems are an interesting uh, tool to take a look at. So next step would be to yeah take a look at and how how to write postmortems. And the first thing that we would like to cover is. When should we write a postmortem? And this has actually two meanings. Let's cover the temporal meaning first. So when should I start writing a postmortem? And let's take the, the common case. You are in an incident. Um, you are currently in the process of mitigating the incident. Um, there, you usually should not start writing a postmortem. Yeah, so that's it's not just not the right time. Make sure that everything that you do um, is captured maybe for later things like record commands that you run or make sure that you that you can extract a written um, yeah, log of the, the communication that happened during the incident capture metrics um, during the incident uh, that help to understand later on uh, the context uh, that you were uh, mitigating the incident these kind of things are really important um, to to do but I make that just part of your incident response yeah that's that's actually the best thing here. Then at some point the incident is mitigated, and as soon as the impact is mitigated, then it's a good point to think about um, should I write a postmortem? And that's the second part actually of the question here: When should you write a postmortem? Should I write a postmortem? And here there are I, I try to summarize this in in, uh, in a little bit of granularity. There are some cases where you must write a postmortem, and I really so so I think. The, the, there should be a clear definition in the team when one must write a postmortem. Yeah, and criteria can be can can be different, and they and they should also depend on your context. Obviously, like could be like number of users affected, or a certain revenue loss, or you have some internal severity metric for outages that you can use. But make make it clear beforehand um, when you uh, must write a postmortem um, just to avoid uh, discussion um, after an incident hey is it something um, where we must write a postmortem or not the second thing are the like the 
it's, it's category that I would see as like the near miss. Yeah. So um, we were pretty lucky. Maybe somebody noticed it very early, and without without that uh, that luck, we it, it could have easily involved into a larger outage. And these are cases where one usually should write a postmortem because yeah, it makes sense to treat them like an actual outage. Yeah. And this is definitely a good learning and definitely good uh, also risk prevention um, in the future if you um, if you follow up on the near misses. And then there are outages which are interesting, which are an interesting learning opportunity. Um, and I mentioned before that there's some effort in uh, writing a postmortem. And I would ask the question, are there interested parties? And is somebody willing to write this up? And if, if you can uh, answer these two uh, with yes, do a quick write up. Don't uh, prevent people, uh, uh, yeah, don't inhibit people and don't prevent uh, people from taking up the stab and, and writing this, this, this thing up. The only thing that I would recommend, make sure that um, make sure that the efforts are scaled appropriately. So if you, for example, have guidance on reviews or on action items that are required for a postmortem, one can see them a bit more relaxed um, for these interesting learning opportunities just to not create a too large barrier for writing up a postmortem. Yeah, so um, let's now come to the point, um, write a postmortem, who actually should author the postmortem. And here, um, I cannot imagine a postmortem to be written only by a single person. So in almost all cases, it's collaborate effort. And um, that means you have multiple authors in a postmortem, people asking questions, people answering questions, um, people contributing by providing additional context, and so on. And to make this as smooth as possible, I think it's really important that you use um, tools that allow real-time and asynchronous collaboration. Uh, for example, via document comments, via suggestions, and so on. So that's the, the tooling part and how a postmortem is written. So it's collaborative. And still, there is someone who needs to coordinate, who needs to drive the process, who needs to ping folks, hey, can you answer that question, um, and so on. And this is the postmortem owner. And I strongly recommend um, that the postmortem owner is a single um, person. And not necessarily this person uh, needs to be involved in the incident. It can be the incident commander. Um, that, that is definitely a, a fair choice. But there can also be um, other choices. And this can also be done ad hoc. Yeah. So in some cases, maybe an, a dev or SRE manager or a tech lead um, is in a better position to drive the postmortem to um, completion. Ah, yeah, one side note I also want to make. Um, make sure that impacted parties are included in a postmortem. In the picture here, there's an SRE team for a third service that was impacted by the outage. Make sure that they are included. If you have customer facing impact, for example, make sure that the product team is included as a proxy for the users and so on. All right, um, who will read your postmortem? So, who is the audience of a postmortem? And there are different classes, I would say, different categories. Um, I try to split this up into three here. And one is everything that is everything, who, everybody who is in uh, or every, every team that is a, directly around your team. So consider it just as team. Folks that are familiar with the context, um, also those are typically the, the people that are working on the action items. And they are, they, they don't need a lot of background information. Um, their main interest is in understanding the root cause, to have a direct learning about what what was uh, yeah what can be in the future, and um, they are also interested in a balanced plan because they are the ones that most likely will execute large portions of it. The second um, class of people are let's say folks in the company. Yeah, and these are not exclusively, but maybe directors, architects, other affected teams, and so on. And the main difference to the team is that um, they are not very familiar with the context. So they, they know the system roughly, but they might not know the internal. So they need a little bit more background information. And their main interest is um, to understand um, yeah, the, the risk or to manage the risk. 
um, to learn from from uh, from error pattern uh, that they see in other teams. And I think for it's very common that for them high impact and near miss postmortems are quite valuable. But also um, cross team postmortems are often interesting at that level because they hint at um, yeah organizational mismatches, for example. And yeah, finally, I want to point out postmortems that are um, that that are interesting for the public or for the customers. And um, here, I think the the key difference is that um, that um, customers or the public are not familiar with the company internals and uh, and the context. And the purpose can be to regain trust um, on the company taking action on an outage or also just um, yeah learning from failures of others. And these these type of postmortems typically require a sec separate document. Um, so I ca ca can't imagine that in most cases it makes sense to just um, yeah publish the internal document even if you remove certain parts. So if you want to see how this uh, how this looks like, I definitely recommend uh, to go um, to um, the um, Google Cloud status. Um, Console, I think it's called, and there are postmortems published for significant outages. And I did myself read a few, and um, I find it always, um, yeah, pretty astonishing how high level you can actually capture the underlying problems and the underlying and, and the yeah, agreed actions um, uh, without, um, uh, yeah, to someone who is not uh, familiar with the full context. So I personally also did learn quite a bit about some systems um, that I was not familiar with. OK, um, so what should we capture um, in a postmortem? And let's first uh, start with the essentials. Um, yeah, the, the, I think the three questions to ask are, what are the underlying root causes? Why or when were they triggered? And how did the impact? Uh, how did it impact the product? Um, and what exactly um, was the impact? Plus an action item plan. The action item plan I will discuss a bit more in detail later. So for the concrete example here, yeah, we had some canary metrics maybe, and the canary metrics didn't detect the bug in a previously unused feature. So that is the root cause. So there's a bug in a previously unused feature, and the canary metrics failed to detect that. Uh, now, the second thing that uh, comes into play is the feature was enabled by accident. So th there was no intent to activate that feature. And that is the trigger. So the enabling the feature and rolling it out was the trigger. So that did set our system into the error state. And then what happened uh, is um, that all our worker threads um, ended up in an error state. And now many people, or it, it often happens that, uh, that this is mistakenly taken as the impact. Uh, but at this point, yeah, if nobody cares about worker threads in an error state, no one is impacted. Yeah? And therefore, it is really uh, important to go one step further and, and ask, OK, so what was the actual impact? And in this case, for example, the product ordering was unavailable for quite a few hours and um, it caused us to lose some revenue. And then the second thing that I mentioned is the action item plan. Again, I promised uh, to take a look at that later. Um, lessons learned. That is also something that's actually my favorite section in almost every postmortem. This is like a free form section where you, uh, yeah, where you can capture your learnings, like what went well, what went poorly, where where, do, where, where, where we got lucky. lucky. And um, I think it's not mandatory, but I think it's a pretty nice format to to yeah to capture thoughts of of the involved uh, persons on on uh, what what they think the learnings are. And then there's a whole bunch of supporting material that I also would definitely recommend to collect. Um, I think one of the most important one is a timeline from my perspective because that allows to you to categorize postmortems, for example, by time to detection and so on and so on. But there are other things like chat logs, everything that helps you understanding the context uh, of the outage of the the people that that that, that were actually um, yeah um, mitigating the outage. Ah, yeah. And before I go to the next slide, again, keep in mind it, postmortems are not purely technical documents, so there might be some fields that you need to fill out and so on. But um, 
they usually tell a story. And the, the gist is that uh, that there is a story in the postmortem because then people like to read it. And um, yeah, it's also a lot more fun. I, re I, I recall postmortem reviews. Um, I will never forget a postmortem review of a postmortem in our team. And um, an engineer in our team, she presented a postmortem to uh, yeah high level leadership. And she really was presenting a pretty nice story and was pointing out that almost every um, deprecation program played into the in the into the into the whole story a little bit, played a role a little bit into the whole story. And it was, yeah, all the people really liked uh, the, the the story that was sold, although it was actually really close to what what really happened. And um, yeah, I think it's it's also about making sure that uh, that story is told in an appropriate way. So. Let's look at an example postmortem. Um, also, um, one thing that I want to point out: this is just an excerpt of the postmortem published in the SRE book. Um, I have captured the main parts on on a few slides just to give you an idea on how a postmortem looks like. But I definitely recommend you to take a look at the book um, to see the full example. So, what we have here is a little bit of metadata that definitely makes sense to capture. Obvious things like a title, Shakespeare sonnet plus plus postmortem, maybe an incident number, and so on. Date, authors, status. So basically, what status is the state is the current document. Summary of what happened, like a one or two level summary that makes it rediscoverable. Um, if you have many postmortems and you read the summaries, you might remember. Okay, this was uh, this outage. Impact and root causes and. Um, this is um, these sections often have a short variant, like an executive summary, and then the the longer variant that can be like a whole section with a lot of narrative. Um, on the other side, I have trigger and resolution and detection. Um, same for here. So the, these are there's usually. Oh, I would recommend to have like a short, um, yeah, pretty crisp uh, part for each of these with a few sentences. And yeah, the longer variant in in the narrative of the postmortem. The reason for the for the um, for the yeah short variant is that if you, for example, systemic systematically look at, hey, do we have a gap in detection? Do we do most of our postmortems are actually uh, do most of our outages are are most of our outages discovered by users that file a bug or a complaint, or do we detect them by monitoring and these questions you can easily answer by, for example, looking at all detection yeah, summaries of your postmortems. Yeah, and uh, again, the narrative is not shown here. So that is um, typically um, text that contains more background, references to documentation, explaining also a little bit what happened in a timeline and why certain um, things uh, were designed that way and so on and so on. Yeah, the second thing that I want to show here um, is the action item plan. So um, this can be a table. Um, so most commonly, it's a table um, listing the actual AIs and their type. And there can be different types. For example, prevention action items. That's the most obvious one. They make sure that we prevent future outages of the same type. But there are also mitigate um, actions that allow you to next time just be more quickly in the mitigation of the outage, for example, by adding some documentation or detection AIs that allow you to um, more quickly detect um, the outage, for example, by some automated alert or something like that, instead of users warning you. And I definitely recommend that all action items um, are tracked in whatever you use internally for tracking features and bugs. And you can use that system also to reference back um, to the postmortem for additional context. And one other thing that I um, think is quite important is every action item ideally is, has a single owner. So it's assigned to a person, not necessarily because that person is the one who um, solves the action item and, for example, implements the fix. But uh, there should be someone who has the current state um, of this action item that who knows, hey, we planned this for next semester, we planned this for the next sprint, and so on. All right, yeah, and finally, um, the lessons learned section that I just mentioned before, um, where um, it's captured what went well, what went wrong, and where we get lucky. And um, 
also the timeline. The timeline is, I think, also something really useful um, to yeah, get an idea of what actually happened from a quick uh, scan. Okay, so um, so far we have talked about um, writing a postmortem. So how does such a process look on a very high level? Let's think about a very simple process. Let's say you have an incident um, that uh, was uh, mitigated, so the incident is over, and the first thing is that you need to decide if you want or must write a postmortem. And let's assume that the answer is yes. Then you start a document draft and um, you start capturing all the information that you have from the outage in that document. And that's the postmortem draft state. And once you have captured a little bit of information, um, you can start analyzing the root cause. There are questions um, that come up um, and, and, and so on. I'll go, to, go, go into that a bit more in detail um, later on. And once you have agreed on the root causes and uh, once you have identified um, actions that you want to resolve, uh, yeah, action items that you want to resolve in the future, the postmortem is reviewed. And I think that's an important part because the review is kind of like the agreement that, yeah, I think, so, so we, we agree that this is, this is our view on what actually happened. Um, and we also agree that this is the list of actions that we want to pursue in order to reduce or um, yeah, eliminate the risk in the future. And then the postmortem is published. So once the review is done, the postmortem is published, and uh, we can resolve uh, the action items. And then there is a like a yeah an additional step at the end. If all the action items are resolved, which can take years, then the postmortem is considered as complete. That means that all risks that we identified in the postmortem or that we identified as worth um, resolving were resolved and as such the postmortem is considered uh, complete. I've talked a couple of times about action items and let's now uh, go into that topic. And uh, let me first uh, talk about prerequisites. Um, then um, let's talk a little bit about how to balance um, action items. So what are considerations here? And finally about execution. But yeah, before we go into the prerequisite uh, topic, um, why are action items important? Uh, because to our users, if we write a postmortem and we have no subsequent action, then this is indistinguishable from not having a postmortem at all. And this is also a quote from uh, Ben Trainer, um, and I think that's actually very true. So if you if you're if you're not intent or if it's unclear if you can commit to any action from a postmortem then it is probably um, creating more frustration than, um, than, um, than use because, uh, yeah, you, you know um, that there's a problem and you accept that you're not going to do something about it. So that's why actions are really important for, for, these, uh, for these outages uh, where you think a postmortem is actually worth, um, worth to do. Uh, the, I, by the way, this is also uh, one other thing. One shouldn't uh, misunderstand this as that we need to follow any action that is possible. So um, actions uh, need a certain commitment, and therefore um, we will also not uh, be able to um, to commit to any action. But it is about identifying the actions that give the most value and that they reduce reduce the risk more uh, the most for um, the effort that you spend. Yeah. Okay, so how, um, so what do we need to, in order to um, create an action item plan? And there are different um, approaches to root cause analysis. And um, two others that I don't have on this slide are um, fault tree analysis or Ishikawa diagrams. Um, and here I'll show uh, a technique called five whys. And the key idea is you, you start from the impact and you ask why until the root cause or multiple root causes are understood and actionable. So in the concrete example, um, users couldn't order a product worldwide. Why was that the case? Because feature X contained a bug, yeah? Why did we have, for example, worldwide impact? And, and the answer is, hmm, we have regional rollouts, but uh, it was rolled out globally. Why was that the case? 
And then the answer is, hmm, um, yeah, because we had canneries, but the canneries didn't use uh, signal Y. Um, and the signal um, would have, um, yeah, would have showed us that uh, that we have a problem and therefore have prevented um, a global rollout of, of the issue. Yeah? And there are other reasons like missing tests and so on. And each of them at some point are actionable. And uh, then it is important to decide what are the most impactful actions for the effort that we have to spend to resolve these. But I really, um, yeah, I, I really want to emphasize: don't try to dive too quickly into actions, yeah, because if you don't ask these questions, yeah, and don't explore the whole space of possible actions to um, to reduce the risk here, then, um, yeah, then then you miss an opportunity to, um, yeah, to maximize the the impact um, by also reducing efforts, yeah. Okay, so let's let's say we have understood um, we have understood our root causes. Um, what do we need to consider when creating an action item plan? And one thing to consider is um, that there are short-term actions that we can do, often called band-aid um, action items, and there are long-term AIs. And I really want to emphasize that often risk can be drastically reduced. Um, with very simple and very cheap AIs. And this is something that I usually uh, would recommend to do because, yeah, because, yeah, the long term AI usually takes quite a while and takes longer as expected and so on. And when you can uh, reduce the risk with a, with a cheap band aid, yeah, um, then it's definitely worth if, if there's risk of recurring, um, then it's definitely worth um, to, to, to fix and apply that first, yeah, because before doing the long term project that re implements everything in Golang. All right, the second thing I want to point out is um, think beyond prevention. And this means that um, we are typically very much focused what do we need to do um, so that this can happen never again? And there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing is that we that we miss out that this is not about happening again, but about reducing the impact of um, of, a, of a repeating um, of a repeating incident. So if uh, if next time when this happens, we for example can quickly detect the problem, or we can very easily mitigate the problem, then these these kind of actions are very valuable um, and and can be a lot cheaper than for example redesigning the entire system. And they also often have the advantage that they are more widely applicable than um, than the very focused fixes of the underlying problems that uh, to prevent recurrence. Yeah, and finally, um, yeah, we agreed that we don't fix uh, humans as a root cause, but we can reduce their ability to make mistakes. So playbooks, protecting dangerous uh, command line flags with an additional question. These are all things um, that um, that definitely make sense and are very cheap. And I recall um, from a previous engagement in a yeah for us for a client uh, startup company, we were uh, rolling out um, every every morning every morning the first one in the office uh, had to press a button and uh, roll had, had to roll out the current release. So our customers were in the United States mainly, and therefore that was picked as the, kind of like the the right time to roll out stuff. And some morning, uh, two people um, came to the office, and, and the first one in the office um, was the person who should do that. And some morning, two people came to the office, didn't see each other, and both um, pressed the button. Yeah, and yeah, ob the obvious solution is design the the design your rollout pipeline in a way that they, it can't be triggered uh, twice. Yeah, but the other um, even much simpler solution that we immediately took was. We bought a, a helmet, like a construction worker helmet, and whoever had that helmet uh, um, was in charge of um, of deploying and and had the token and had the right to actually press the button also during the day and so on. And yeah, while this was also yeah kind of like a yeah humorous approach to the to the to the problem, it was pretty effective. Yeah, and later on we extended that, for example, by having a physical checklist for certain items to prevent that two people made a modification at the same time and so on. So often very simple solutions 
um, yeah, to process uh, hiccups um, can actually greatly reduce the risk. Okay, um, postmortem is published. Hooray! What's next? Yeah, celebration. So when a postmortem is published, when we have all agreed this is the plan to move forward, then it's really time to to celebrate this because it is often quite a bit of alignment um, necessary to uh, achieve that point. And um, yeah, what you can do now is you can share the postmortem and review clubs. You can create a postmortem of the month um, that you celebrate separately, or you can replay that with new engineers and a team as a wheel of misfortune exercise. But make sure that you that you use the postmortem to learn as an organization. All right, a few words. Celebration is over. Yeah, a few words about uh, how to execute on action item plans. First of all, make sure that the priorities are correctly picked and that they are really understood. So work on the highest value, um, lowest effort action items first, because they give you yeah, most uh, risk reduction for least effort. And also, um, do not underestimate the effort that it costs to track action items. So that's also something that I usually would call out, hey, if it's just a small improvement to the documentation, just that that takes you half an hour, do it because then it's off the table. Nobody asks about that AI anymore. Um, yeah, speaking about uh, reviewing a, a action items um, again. So I definitely recommend reviewing them from time to time. So this can be, for example, every half year or something like that. But make sure that they are reviewed regularly because Priorities change. Yeah, prior priorities may have changed. Um, there is, uh, yeah, one sees the outage after half a year maybe differently than before. Um, the risk profile might have changed, and so on. And um, this is something that you only um, can address if you revisit your postmortem action item. Yeah, and make sure that you identify uh, postmortems um, where the um, yeah action item progression is not uh, not as far as you would have expected it before, because they are at risk of reoccurring and uh, creating the same or even a larger um, yeah, impact than, than they had in the past. Yeah, finally, also make sure that executives have a focus on outages and on the progression to uh, mitigate these in the future and to reduce the impact in the future. Be transparent about how many AIs you have resolved, how long it takes to publish a postmortem, and these kind of things, just to make sure that they that they have a feeling that this process is giving them some value. At the end, um, postmortems are really good at valuing at measuring the value of um, of reliability engineering, and um, this th this value can only be surfaced if um, if one at least at a high level um, creates the visibility. Okay, so how how do you get started? Yeah, so um, that's a question you've now seen all the slides, what one can do and what one needs to consider. So what are the things that one should consider first before one actually maybe gets started? And there are a few recommendations that I would like to give. And the first first one is, is one from um, several observations that I have seen in the past. Um, not so much at Google, actually. So I think at Google, um, this is just kind of like the, the error culture at Google is just set. Nobody questions that. But um, what you really need to make sure is that you have leadership buy-in for a couple of things. First of all, for the effort of writing postmortems. Yeah, if you don't get the buy-in for the effort, then obviously it's hard to do so. Um, the second more important thing is that you really get leadership buy-in for blameless postmortems. And leadership can do a lot about this, for example, by admitting mistakes themselves and thus serve as an example, yeah? And um, by celebrating uh, folks who, um, who yeah, share their mistakes and to, who share, share, um, share a postmortem. Yeah, I, I, I recall, um, Quite a few internal events where that actually happened, and it was always um, greatly appreciated. And uh, so, no, but I think folks didn't feel uncomfortable in sharing their their failures. And if you have that culture um, 
ensured by leadership and also ensured that postmortems are not used as a tool to blame one team or the other team, then you have the right um, mindset and culture to, to get started with, um, with um, postmortems. And finally, you need to get buy-in that yeah, postmortems also create action items and that these actions need to prioritize, not all at the same time, but um, that there are at least some that you probably pretty quickly want to work on. And um, as such, um, I, I point this out because um, many other things work bottom up. I think with postmortem, with, without uh, the a certain buy-in from leadership, um, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, the second thing that I think is really important, define a criteria for when a postmortem must be written. And don't aim too high. Just make sure that you can build up some muscle memory so that you're not having to exercise writing a postmortem for the first uh, large outage. Yeah? And you can tweak that criteria at the beginning just to make sure that you that you get the right exposure to the process. And yeah, finally, I also want to call out, have a simple process. Make, make sure that you have clear ownership and clear responsibilities, but start with a really simple process. And uh, when you start simple, then the, the second thing that you can do is that you can wait for perfection. Yeah, don't, don't over-index on reviews or sign-offs or people rubber stamping postmortems. Just start with it and, and learn from postmortems and also learn from the process. Yeah, and that's kind of like the guidance that I can give you to, to start. I've seen it a couple of times fail in the past um, to get these processes introduced in various teams, mostly actually because of the first point that I mentioned about the missing uh, buy-in from leadership. Um, and um, in, also I've seen in, in several cases that very simple processes are actually quite uh, powerful. So don't aim for the huge process that, uh, that we, for example, have internally. Yeah, and with that, um, I would like um, to thank you all. If you have listened uh, to my postmortem story uh, so far, I definitely recommend um, a read of the um, of the two chapters in the site reliability engineering book, and there is also a section in the SRE workbook. Both are available online. There are detailed examples. There's, there are a couple of case studies, and there's also a checklist um, available in in these books. And um, yeah, take these as a reference point, but don't take these as the only truth and the and the, yeah and the most uh, and the best uh, the, well best thought through example that you just can blindly apply. And yeah, just a reminder: if you have questions, if you have feedback, I would really appreciate um, if you drop me a line. And um, yeah, with that, thank you, and I hope I see some folks of you also at some point in person. Thanks.